So good to see y'all. I'm glad you can see me. I said that this morning, and I still mean it tonight. <laughs> tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Jesus, who is called Christ. Now a lot of people think that Jesus Christ is his name, the full name, but actually it's a title or a, a description. I guess it would be a good word. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Christ. Well, we're going to talk a little bit here tonight from verses 16 to 18 about the genealogy of Jesus, the Christ. Matthew begins his book with these words. The book of generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, it is exactly the same phrase found in Genesis. Moses begins chapter 5 of Genesis. This is the book of gen generations of Adam. And there the gods created man in the likeness of God, made, him, made he him. Male and female, uh, you know, I want you to get that straight now. Male and female created he to them, blessed them, blessed them, and called them uh, named Adam. In the day when they were created, mankind was made in the likeness of God. In the likeness of God. Note in the likeness, Romans 8, 3 and 4 teaches us uh, for the, what the law could not do in the weak through the flesh. God's sending, boy, I got gnats up here or something. I guess I should have taken a shower. <laughs> wow. God sending his own son in the likeness of uh, that uh, sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled and that Jesus came in the likeness of mankind, but what? Had no sin. Had no sin. The likeness of Philippine, uh, Philippines. <laughs> Philippians. Go we'll get it. Philippians. Second honeymoon already? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, Philippians 2, 7 and 9 teaches that Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant which made the likeness of man and being found in the fashion of a, as a man, he uh, handled himself and, whoop, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has uh, highly exalted him and give him a name which is above every name. Which is above every name. In verse 1, there are three messianic titles for Jesus. In verse 1, the, the book of the genealogies of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. So it's Jesus the Christ, the son of May, uh, David, and the son of Abraham. We also know uh, uh, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Lord of salvation, Christos, the anointed one. Matthew 16, uh, Jesus asked him, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and says, You are the Christ, the Son of God. The Son, of, excuse me, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If somebody asks you today, or if somebody said, you know, who is Jesus Christ? Tell me who he is. You go to church every Sunday, you go to church Sunday night, you go to church Wednesday night. Why do you do that? Who is Jesus to you? They say, he's the son of the living God. And not only that, but he is God. He is God. So often we forget that. Well, here's the, the next one is the son of David. Now, I, I got to, um, let me turn back over here. I got some figures here. Because we're talking about uh, they're going to talk about a minute here. And I want to, let me go ahead and read these verses. Uh, uh, if I can, boy, it's like, somebody moved my pulpit forward or something here. I don't know. All right, in Jacob we got Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom uh, born Jesus was, who was called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14
14 generations. Now, I was very curious about that, so I went and looked up how many years is 14 generations. 1,024 years. That is a long time. So we're talking about 73 uh, years old as a generation. That's not bad. You know, really. Because I don't know what's the, what's the life expectancy now? Average life expectancy. It was in the 80s for the women and it was like 79 for men for the U.S. Okay, that's, that's pretty darn good. So we haven't gained all that much, have we? Six years? But we think we're so smart. You know, it's really amazing. Yeah, really amazing. All right. Son of David, Jesus asked in Matthew 22, 45, how does David, <clears throat> the Spirit, call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make you enemies your footstool. If David uh, then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one uh, was able to answer this him a word, nor after that day uh, on did anyone dare question him anymore. You know why they didn't question him? Because they couldn't intelligently ask a question. You know, when uh, you get to ask a lot of questions at times, and sometimes you wonder, where's that person's head at? What are they thinking? You know, some of the, and then I think, I, I think over the years I figured this out. They like hearing their own voice. <laughs> they want to say something it seems so intelligent, but actually, doesn't it say it's better to be quiet? You know, no, it's, it's better to be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> and that's the way that goes. It says, okay. Son of David. Now we're going to talk about the son of Abraham. Do you know the Jews took a great pride in talking about their oral history or their oral genealogy. They could tell you who we got, who we got, who we got, who, all the way back to Abraham. All the way back to Abraham. You know, now they want to take it, and they're looking for the red heifer. Now, if you all don't know what the red heifer is, you might want to study that this week. It's good to know what the red heifer is. But <clears throat> they want to start sacrificing again if they can ever rebuild the temple. But there's one catch. You have to be a Levite from the tribe of Levi in order to do the sacrifices. Well, the genealogies are so messed up now, through the years, who's from the tribe of Levi? They got a problem. They got a problem. If they just pick anybody, then they're going against the Word of God. And they don't want to do that. You know, it's kind of like that church. Now, I got a job here, and you're going to fill it. You know, I got a job. I need, I need a... a, a a deacon, and you're going to be the deacon here. I need this, and you're going to be it. So many churches have gotten in trouble doing that very same thing. Because I believe, I don't care if Carol, like Carol's on here mowing the grass. I'm telling you what, you got to be called to that job. That's, that's not something everybody wants to do. Carol had nobody arguing with her, saying, don't, no, no, I'll do it. Let me do it. Right, Carol? Not one person stepped up, but you got to be called to that. When you're in here cleaning the church, you got to be called to that. You do it as unto the Lord. You want to do your very best when you're doing that. You want to make sure that you, when you're working for God, it is your very best. Whether young people, whether you're in school and you're doing, you got homework assigned to you, or you got an assignment of some kind. You want to do your very best because God, hey, hey, listen to me up here. You, you can listen to him all the rest of the week. Listen to me now. You got, you got to make understand that when you're in, somebody asks you to do something, uh, your dad says, son, I want you to go out and mow that grass. You go out there and do it as unto the Lord. Do your very best because you know what? If you don't do your best, then you got to figure out time to do it again. So do your very best the first time. Thank you. All right. Son of Abraham, John 8, 56. Jesus said to him, Your father, Adam, uh, excuse me, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. 
then send the Jews unto him. Art thou yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, but Abraham was, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Now, when he said that alone, he could have got in big trouble because what did they call Yahweh? I am. I am that I am. When Moses asked him, Who's, who shall I say is sending me to talk to Pharaoh? Just tell him, I am sent you. I am. <laughs> tell you what, that gets me. And in enough to the generation, see all the generations and covenants. We we're talking about covenants with uh, the Abraham. Uh, didn't they just have something about that on television? The Abraham co covenant? Uh, the Abraham Accord or something, wasn't it? Oh, that uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump negotiated with him over there. And they uh, had such a great thing about uh, having that uh, done. Uh, Abraham to David, the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant, the promise of God established with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was recorded in Genesis 12 and state that God would uh, bless Abraham in two ways. In two ways. God would make Abraham into a great nation and so make his name great. He's going to, his descendants is going to be more than the stars in the sky and more than the sand on the beach. Can you pick up, can you go to the beach and pick up a handful of sand and tell me how many grains are in that sand? Why, my goodness, you know, you'd be forever counting, counting the sand. And look at, look at how big the beaches are. But think this, God said that your descendants will be more numerous than that. Woo! That's pretty good, isn't it? Number two, though, the, through him, God would mediate blessings to all people on earth. To all people on earth. For God so loved the whole world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. Man, isn't that a blessing? Amen. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Can I get a good amen on that? Amen. Woo! All right. Let's get excited here. David to Babylon. David to Babylon. Okay. The David Devonic covenant. The covenant identifies more precisely the lineage of the offspring who will mediate international blessings. He will be a royal descendant of Abraham through David, with the great nations promised to Abraham now firmly established. Attention zooms into his royal, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, royal line culminates in the individual a conquering offspring who fulfills the promise of Genesis 22:18. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And whose seed? Who's going to bless all the nations? Come on now. Jesus. Jesus is going to be a blessing to all nations. You know, the, 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 right now, we need Jesus more than we have ever needed him before in the history of mankind. You know, and I really believe. I, I, I can't, I'm not going to stand up here saying, okay, November 8th, November 8th of this year, Jesus will be coming back. You better, be, you better sell everything you got and, and to go with me onto the mountaintop and we'll wait for him. That was pulled back in 1913, by the way, and that pastor lost face because of it. Matter of fact, he tried two other dates to try and hit it. Nobody knows. Only the Father knows. Jesus, I don't even know. But when the Father tells me to go, I'm going to go. And I pray it soon. I really do. You know, I think, I hate to say this, but I think that the only way that we'll have peace again is when Jesus comes back. You know, mankind, we, we've twisted the truth. We've twisted everything. We're trying to destroy our history. We're trying to change everything. So, you know, the people that, that control the past control the future. Yeah. They can tell you, you know, they're, they're trying to tell us now, America is a terrible, terrible nation. 
This is, they should be, you should be ashamed of being an American. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm pretty proud of being an American. I'm proud of that flag. You know, I'm proud of this flag over here. And, you know, and I, when we pulled up here this evening, and I looked up there and I was watching those flags on the flagpole out there, and I told Dolly, I said, aren't that beautiful? Isn't that just beautiful, watching that flag? Just, it just throws my heart to think about it. And I tell you, if you ever put the uniform on, you know what I'm talking about when you look at that flag and you see it. Blesses my heart. Babylon the Christ, the new covenant now we're going to be talking about. The new covenant, it says here, so referred to explicitly as a new covenant. And what do we call that new covenant? The New Testament. The New Testament. The old covenants, the old testament. Now we got the New Testament now through Jesus Christ. No longer do we need to go and take animals and bulls and goats and sheep and birds and all that and sacrifice them on the, on the altar because Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross because the Bible says without well, the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins. He had to shed his blood. He had to go die on that cross, that horrible, horrible death. Because the, uh, the Jewish people believe that you're cursed if you're hung upon the tree. You're cursed if you're hung upon the tree. And that's what they call the cross on that old tree. What a horrible, horrible way that had to be. I told you about before how they, why they break the legs on the, they had to break the legs on the two prisoners, one on each side of them that was crucified. Because when you break the legs, you can no longer Push yourself up to get a breath, to get a breath. So when you sag down with broken legs, you just hang there until you die of asphyxiation. You can't get a breath. Wouldn't it be awful? Huh? Ooh. But Jesus didn't have to have a broken bone because it was prophesied 600 years before that. Jesus would not have a broken bone. He gave up his life. They didn't take it from him. Because he, when he said, it is finished, he breathed his last. He breathed his last. Yes, the new covenant, the new testament. Jesus declares the new co uh, te covenant is established in the sacrifice. Uh, Luke 22, 19 to 21. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and sent it and said, This is my body, which is uh, given, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What's that say in front of that table? Do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we do every time we have the Lord's Supper. By the way, Michael, we need to get that another Lord's Supper before the, we got all that stuff back there to do it now. That's what we need. We need to do that, that, that Eucharist, they call it in the Catholic Church, I think it is. That, that, whole, that Lord's Supper. We need to do that. Because we need to do it in remembrance. We need to remember what Jesus did for us. We can't forget that. You know, they try to steal our past. They take our statues and everything else and tear them down. But what Jesus did can never be destroyed. It can never be wiped out. Because you know why? It's God's word that we have here in the Bible. Oh yeah, they tried to destroy the Bible. I remember reading the book one time when there was prisoners uh, and they couldn't, weren't allowed to own the Bible. Well, they snuck the Bible in and what they did was they would rip page, uh, like a chapter out of the Bible. And they had what they called the living Bible. You know, that's a term that they were selling living Bibles at one time, I think here. But they, they had a real living Bible because it would be your turn and you'd quote Matthew 1. Your turn, you'd quote Matthew 2. Word for word. Word for word. That's how important it is, the Word of God. You know, we don't realize how important it is time they try to take it from us. And then we're ready to fight. And you know, we've been called the silent majority for so many years that they think we're just old whips, you know. And you know what? They're poking a the bear. They're poking a the bear when they're poking a the Christian. Because we, I'm not going to stand up and say, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to deny Jesus? Not a, at all. I'm going to die. I'll die before I do that. And I'm telling you the truth. Because he died for me. 
He died for me in that old cross. Should I do less? I don't think so. Should I not tell people about my Jesus? I don't think so. I think it's the right thing to do. Amen? Amen. Come on now. Amen. Amen. All right. I heard you before. I know you can do it. All right. The gospel, when it's, uh, uh, Mary, Mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, because they came together, uh, be, be, excuse me, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Why is the virgin birth so essential? Why, why is that so important? Because it was prophesied. Because Jesus is not the son of Adam. Jesus is the son of God. You know, through Adam, the first Adam, sin came into the world. Cain slew Abel. And sin entered into the world. But through the second Adam, what Jesus has been called, the second Adam, forgiveness of that sin, a way to be forgiven, has entered into the world. Amen, brother. I'll tell you what, that's so important when you think about that. Without the Jesus coming on the cross, we would still be knee-deep in sin. And up here in our sin, actually. But thank God. God loved us so much. It says, while I was yet a sinner, Jesus died for me. I didn't have to get all cleaned up and clean, you know, and do all these special things. But Jesus still went to the cross all those years ago. And he says, because Jim Sharp is going to need a Savior. He can't save himself. He needs, he needs me. He needs me to die for him. Thank God. Thank God. And yeah, he included you folks too, because it's in the whole world, everybody. But you know, there again, not everybody's going to accept the Savior. Not everybody's going to accept it. There, I don't want to. I don't want to change my way of life. I like my way of life. Yeah, I'm going to party. I'm going to party, party. I'm just going to keep doing it until I die, and then I'm going to hell. Then I'm going to hell. Listen, if you're out in a boat and you're sailing along in the boat and all of a sudden you hit a, well, you know, you got to watch when you're sailing because with these cargo container ships, a lot of those containers go overboard. And you can, they're so low in the water you can't see them very good. So you go, when you got to be careful when you're sailing, you keep an eye out. Like they say, keep a weather eye out too. But you got to keep an eye out for them. Because otherwise, you're in trouble. You're going to put a hole in your boat, and if boats don't float very good with holes in them, you know, and they just kind of gurgle, gurgle down. But at the same time, we carry life preservers, don't we? And, the, and the, each boat has to have a life jacket for each person aboard, you know. And we carry flare guns to shoot up to get help. Well, you know what? Jesus is our life jacket. He's the one that we can put on, and we can begin to save. And you know what that flare gun is? My, my daughter-in-law, Debbie, she talked about that. That's a flare prayer. Because when you're sitting in the water and you're treading water and there's these fins going all around you and they're not porpoise, you're going to be saying, Lord, I need you. I need you help. I need you now. And you know what? That's what you do when you realize, what a sinner I am. I'm such a sinner. And like Paul says, I'm the chief sinner. I said this morning, if you're a sinner, you're a sinner. There's no, there's no degree. There's no saying, you're a little sinner, you're a big sinner, and you're, a, well, a mediocre sinner. You're not even a good sinner, you're an average sinner. Average, you know what that is? That's neither good nor bad. That's just average. Really nothing. So, please, please. When you make that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, you young people back there as well, when you make that commitment to Jesus Christ, make it like you mean it. Because you know what? It's an eternal, eternal, something for eternity, a decision that you're making. Where are you going to spend eternity? Your choice. Your choice. I hope you make the wise one. I hope you make the right one. Why is the virgin birth? I won't get back to my sermon now, by the way. All right, so the prophecy would be fulfilled, Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Now all this was done, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, 
a virgin shall be with child and should uh, bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel Emmanuel which be interpreted God with us you know we talk about this mostly at Christmas time but you know what we ought to think about it year round because it really is a gift that we have year round with us it's not one of the gift that you just get at Christmas, it's under the tree, you open it up, you play with it for a while, you throw it away and you play with the box. No, it's a year-around gift that we have from God. It's a gift of love. A love. And that's what Jesus is. Oh, man. So we, uh, so we should, uh, would know that he was not born of Adam, but born of God. Romans 5, Paul teaches. Just as though one man sin entered, I already said this, sin entered the world, and they, uh, death through sin, then death spread to all men. See, there wasn't, people didn't die before this, unless they were beat to death by their brother. But because of all sin, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those, uh, even over those who had uh, not sinned according to the likeness and the uh, transgressions of Adam. Folks, I know sometimes you think I get a little excited up here, and I do. And I'm glad of it. I'm glad of it. Uh, because I want you to know something. If you don't get excited about Jesus, your exciter machine is broken. You need to get your exciter valve checked because it's sticking. You know what? You need to get excited when you think about what he's done for us us. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. But yet he went and died for me. And when he called me to preach, I, I couldn't believe it. I kept uh, telling uh, my friend, I said, I, I really feel a calling, but I feel so inadequate. Finally, my pastor says, Jim, that's why they got college. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Michael can tell you that that's a great time was in college. You just, you just amongst Christians, and the atmosphere is so nice, and you go there to learn about God. And the professors, I had some great professors there, and I really appreciate them. And, uh, Dr. Windsor, my, my preaching professor, I just thank the world and all of him. Now, Michael, you said he retired now, right? Yeah. Great man, great man. But they investing their lives in training people in order to preach the word. They're training people to take and go into the world, whether it be in the United States or around the world. I know I got friends right now in China. They, you know, they can't call themselves missionaries because they'll put them in prison if they do. And, but they're over there. They're English translators. But they're there. I got friends in Thailand that are missionaries there interpreters there. But, you know, my neighbor, Jerry, uh, up there by where I live, he was a missionary for years up in the Amazon. Him and his family. The new tribes missions. They go where most missionaries don't go. If you ever want to learn about them, read the book, Tip of the Spear. That's a great book. People are going. They're leaving their comfort zone. They're getting out of the home. They're getting away from. They're getting away from cell phones. They're getting away from TVs. They're living in the jungles with the natives. Why? Because they want to lead those people to the Lord. God just didn't come for the affluent people in this world. He come for the ones that are living in the jungles, ones that are living in mud huts. You know, because why? He loved them. He loves us. Woo! You think about that. Almighty God loves us. <laughs> I tell you, we get the best of the deal when you think about it. Because God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God. Well, I want you to know this has been an exciting time for me this evening, preaching this word because I truly believe it. And folks, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be off fishing somewhere. I'm 
Dolly and I building that old fishing boat I got, and we'd be catching fish. What we Dolly? Dolly keeps saying, where are we going fishing? Where are we going fishing? I don't know. But one day we're going to. So, I just pray that y'all have a blessed week, a safe week. And you know what? I want you to do me a favor this week. I want you to start your days with you, when you have your prayer time. I want you to say, God, please. And you folks out there on the internet as well. Start your day this way. God, please, give me someone to talk to today. Give me someone to talk to today about you. And you know what? As you do that, and Jesus, uh, God will see, you know what? That person is faithful. That person does what I need to done. He's talking about Jesus. I'm going to put more people in his path. Now this person over here, he says he likes to talk to people, but he don't. He doesn't ever mention it, doesn't even talk, acknowledge he goes to church. He just doesn't do it. Folks, we need to get serious about the Lord. Are we going to serve Him? Or are we going to serve Baal? Are we going to, who are we going to serve? Who are you going to serve? You're going to have your own little idols? Wouldn't that be a cute little idol? It reminds me of a program I've seen where an Aborigine in Australia found an empty Coke bottle. And he walked for days to take it back to the person that dropped it because they thought it was such a special thing. An empty Coke bottle. <laughs> Bow with me, please. Father God, as we come to the close of this service tonight, I do wish, Father, and I pray, God, that you'd be with us, each and every one of us as we go our way this week. I pray, God, that we'll take that challenge of praying to be able to speak to somebody about you, to tell somebody of what you've done in our lives. Like Michael says, testimonies are a powerful thing. God, and may we always have that testimony right on the tip of our tongue, ready to tell somebody what you've done. And Lord, not just what you did 45, 50 years ago when you saved me, Lord, but what you've done today, what you've done yesterday. God, it's just you're, every day you get me up out of bed, Lord, it's a blessing. Every day I've got a breath in my lungs, it's a blessing to me, God. And thank you for that. Thank you for the wonderful report I got from the cancer doctor this week, God. And I just praise you for that. Lord, it's just so exciting on how you're doing in my life. And I know other people here have got the same same kind of testimonies, Father, of what you're doing in theirs. You're an awesome, mighty God. We love you, Lord, and thank you, Father. And God, I, again, I just pray you'd go with us, watch over us, and keep us safe. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Oh, oh. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.